Well, uh, welcome to another interview uh, conducted by uh, EFSAS. And this time we have uh, Mr. Uh, Taha Siddiqui with us. Uh, Mr. Siddiqui, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, Mr. Taha Siddiqui is a prominent award-winning investigative Pakistani journalist who, uh, before he left Pakistan, was covering Pakistan for over a decade. Uh, when based in Islamabad, he reported for several national and international news organizations, including the New York Times, The Guardian, and France 24. Um, he has traveled throughout Pakistan and Afghanistan, producing news features and long-form documentaries. In 2014, uh, Mr. Siddiqui won the Albert Londres uh, Prize, which is known as the French Pulitzer uh, Award for uh, your documentary on polio in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, his focus areas include terrorism, civil military affairs and minorities. And you have also in the recent past been known as a fierce social media critic of Pakistan's powerful military establishment. Um, coming, and of course you will tell about this uh, much more in detail, but you left Pakistan in January, 2018 when you survived an abduction attempt after armed men believed to be uh, state agents tried to kidnap you. Um, and now you're living in France, in Paris, uh, and you continue your fight for freedom of expression and press. Um, and you have, you're not, you have founded um, Safe Newsrooms. Uh, I guess that's a website um, or a media outlet. And you're also the owner of a bar called the Dissident Club, which is a political cultural bar. Um, and that brings me to also your recent autobiography, um, which has just been published in France. It's with the same title, The Dissident Club. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is it's not a you know traditional first account uh, book. It's it's a it's a graphic novel in a comic book format. Um, I'm sure I'm not doing justice to your introduction. That there should be a lot of other things as well. But you know, we'll give you the chance to talk about yourself. Um, again, welcome. And um, you know, as I've told you, these interviews are of course about political issues currently in 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 our region in South Asia in Pakistan particularly. Uh, but before we come to that. Um, you're now in Paris, you're in France. So how did this happen? Well, uh, as you explained uh, briefly in uh, January 2018, on 10th of January to be precise, uh, 2018, uh, I, w I survived uh, an abduction and assassination attempt by armed men that I believe were from the Pakistan army, <clears throat> uh, perhaps from the Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI. Uh, proceeding to this attack, I was uh, uh, threatened several times by the Pakistan military, uh, by the ISPR, which is the military media wing, by the ISI directly, by MI military intelligence, who would visit my office, visit my place, call me on the phone, talk to my family members, talk to my friends, journalists, etc., telling them that uh, Taha, Taha was uh, crossing a red line when he reports uh, what that red line was, they would never specify, but they would say that. And basically what I was doing was I was investigating the Pakistan military's human rights abuses uh, in different parts of the country. I was talking about their political uh, involvement in the country, and I was talking about their businesses uh, that the Pakistan military runs. So for several years leading up to uh, the attack on 10th of January 2018, I had received multiple threats, intimidations, harassment. I had also faced in 2017 a counterterrorism and cybercrime case under the Prevention Electronic Crimes Act, uh, which is uh, a law that was passed in 2016. And in 2017, I was the first journalist in Pakistan to face charges under that. Uh, I challenged those charges in the court with Asma Jangir, who was alive at that time as my lawyer, and uh, got some relief from the courts. And a few months after that, uh, the, in, uh, the these armed men attacked me. <clears throat> I managed to, uh, fortunately, uh, due to uh, the, the bad organization of this, this uh, you know, kidnapping attempt, I managed to escape. Uh, and once I escaped, 
I asked for police protection from the Pakistani government. Uh, it was the government of PMLN, the Nawaz Sharif government at that time, uh, in 2018, January. And Essen Iqbal, who was the interior minister at that time, invited me for a personal meeting where he told me that the Pakistani government has no problems with me, but the military does. And if I do not uh, stop speaking up and, and writing about the military, uh, you know, I could face even worse consequences. Uh, and he he advised me to apologize to the military chief, uh, General Bajwa, who was the last military chief who just retired recently. Uh, following this, I understood that, you know, if the country's interior minister is uh, not willing to protect me or does, is not, does not have the capacity to protect me, uh, maybe it's time that I should relocate from Pakistan and uh, think about what options do I have. So this is the time when I decided uh, to leave and come to France uh, because I was working with the French media. I had I have the Khial Gagond, which is like known as the French Pulitzer. So I had very strong connections in France with the media, with the society, uh, and the French embassy also helped uh, in Islamabad. Uh, getting me uh, a visa quickly and getting me out of the country. Once I arrived in France, the idea was not to stay here for too long. The idea was that I would take a break and I will decide what to do. Uh, but in the meantime, when I was here in France and I traveled to the US, I was contacted by French uh, authorities and American authorities who told me that my name is on a kill list. And if I ever go back to Pakistan, I would be killed. Uh, at the same time, they also told me that I should be very uh, careful uh, from going to any Pakistan-friendly countries like the middle in the Middle East, like China, uh, Turkey, etc. And they also told me that I should be careful and and be cautious uh, in even in in, in Paris. Uh, and I've been I've been told that uh, my name is not the only one on the kill list. There is uh, a social media blogger. Uh, in Netherlands by the name of Akas Guraya, who, whose name is on it. And his assassin was actually caught by the British police and is convicted for life right now. Uh, Dr. Aisha Siddiqua, who's a very well-known academic uh, living in London in exile, her name is also on the list. And there are other few people that we know are on that list. Uh, at the same time, we know that there have been two cases of Pakistanis who have been killed in exile. Uh, you know, who have been found dead in exile. Uh, one of one of them is Sajid Hussain in Sweden, and the other one is of Karima Baloj in Canada. Both were mysterious deaths. We believe that had something to do with the Pakistan military. So, I mean, overall, even though that I'm in exile now, uh, I'm not completely safe. Uh, but I continue to write. I continue to speak up because that was the reason why I left Pakistan. Uh, so I continue to uh, uh, write for several international publications. Uh, I continue to manage the dissident club where we do political activities, cultural activities, a lot of times focusing on Pakistan. Um, and uh, I just launched uh, my autobiography with the name of the bar that I have, the dissident club. Um, so, so that's a bit of a brief introduction of why uh, I'm here in, in, in France. Okay. Uh, well, that's a that's a very interesting story. So let's let, let's take that a little bit bit by bit. You say, of course, there was in um, in Pakistan there was an attempt to kidnap you. So I would say kidnap and kill because the thing is that in Pakistan we have these things called the enforced disappearances, mm -hmm. uh, which basically means that people go missing without trials, without any kind of process. Uh, and they're kept in secret prisons. Those secret prisons are the very prisons that I was actually investigating and I had published a report about them for the New York Times uh, in 2014, 15 investigations that I did. And these, uh, these, uh, the military, when they take you away, uh, they decide what they want to do. So first you're kidnapped and then they decide whether they would let you go, which happens rarely. Uh, usually they torture you for years. And sometimes they kill you and then they uh, bury you in unknown graves. Uh, we found mass graves in Balochistan, uh, several times of people who were gone missing. So this phenomena of enforced disappearances started from 
Balochistan, where Pakistan military has been running secret operations uh, to quell the insurgency and the right of self-determination for the Baloch people. At the same time, now this enforced disappearances phenomena has even become much wider. It's happening in Karachi. It's happening in Islamabad, in Punjab, uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, of course, in Kashmir, uh, which is Pakistan-administered uh, or occupied Kashmir, uh, Gilgit Baltistan also. So the, this is happening all over uh, Pakistan, yeah. actually. And we know that around about 15 to 20,000 people are missing right now in Pakistan. No, th th that, that, that's certainly correct. And you, you say that you believe that these were, um, these were men from the Pakistani military or Pakistani intelligence agencies. Um, of course, in the recent past, we have, for example, seen that another international award-winning uh, journalist, uh, Hamid Mir, was, was shot. <laughs> And, and he and he just narrowly survived so just just to get a a feel of it these these are highly trained um you know uh, military people um how did you manage to thwart this attack on you i mean <clears throat> basically uh, even though if they are highly trained mm -hmm. uh, i think they when you use brute force against people, uh, you tend to make mistakes. Uh, the, you know, for them, they are very, the Pakistan military operates with this, you know, this idea that they're invincible and they are untouchable. And uh, because they, they sort of like occupy Pakistan, they, they run the country, they own the country. So in my case, particularly, if you talk about the, the day that happened, actually, I was put into a car and that car was moving away on the road while when I realized that there was an unlocked door uh, that I, I jumped out of. And once I jumped out of that unlocked door, it was on the Islamabad highway. Uh, there was a divider in the middle of the road and I jumped and I ran to the other side of the road and ran towards Islamabad because I was going to the airport that, that, that day for, I was traveling for work uh, and I was going to come back to Islamabad in a few days. So I ran towards the Islamabad, uh, on the Islamabad highway ran towards Islamabad um, uh, city uh, because the airport is on the other side of the city and managed to get to a police station where I called my journalist friends who came and I did a big press conference and I accused the military of doing it. Uh, during the during the kidnapping that was going on, the kidnappers knew my name. Uh, they they were calling me by my name. They were saying, Taha Siddiqui, what do you think of yourself? Uh, they were cussing me out. They were they were uh, using abusive language, and <clears throat> at the same time, I remember this clearly. And this was mentioned in my my report also. And we found some uh, visual evidence of it in the CCTV that there was a military vehicle that passed by that I tried to ask for help for, which did not help me because I think the they knew what that they were the military comrades. They were like their their own friends. Uh, the car that was used for, for kidnapping me, uh, it had a fake number plate and the place where I was attacked, the cameras were not working. They were cut off. Uh, so the CCTV cameras on Islamabad highway were cut off. So all of these things indicate uh, that it was, you know, uh, a very well organized uh, attempt. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think uh, basically the unlocked door really helped me uh get out of the situation and i think the unlocked door was because uh, they thought that i was going to be very scared and i would be taken away without any resistance but i wanted to resist because i've had some hostile environment training as a journalist mm -hmm. and in in hostile environment trainings you've been told you're you're told that the first few minutes of when you're kidnapped are very crucial uh, for you to ensure that you might get freed so i use those first few minutes uh, to sort of, uh, you know, uh, get myself out of the situation and I was able to get to safety. So is, is it also true to say that while you got into this very awkward situation because of being a journalist, you were also saved because you were a journalist? Uh, one, because of your training, but also because of, you know, getting to a police station, getting this high profile, getting your journalists, friends over there doing a press conference. So that is also one of the reasons that you're alive today. I mean, yes, uh, basically, you know, I've, I've gone through therapy 
uh, because I've had trauma counseling afterwards. And 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 one of the things that my tra trauma counselor, my therapist said, which was interesting, was that he said to me that you know because you were threatened for so many years before this attack happened your brain really functioned on an automatic pilot or version where it knew what to do. You didn't have to direct your brain. So it was very quick thinking, very quick response uh, because of the training I had, because of the uh, the threats I've had that I, 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 my basic objective was to get out of it and protect myself somehow or the other. And I managed to do all of that. Uh, and my therapist thinks it has to do a lot with, you know, the, the years of, uh, threats and intimidation and harassment that I faced, that I was prepared for it, and I acted in the best interest for myself. And um, is it also true that during those years, I read somewhere that you were actually called into uh, General Bajwa's office um, and you were told that anything you would write on, especially on Twitter, must be approved by his office first? Yes, that was uh, General Asim Bajwa, who was the military media chief uh, from 2011 to 2015, if I remember correctly, some those along those years. And he was uh, he told me this. Uh, this was after I did a report for the Christian Science Monitor, which I was reporting for. It's an American newspaper. Then I did an, another report for the New York Times, and so he he would call me and he would say. Do not, do not, you know, tweet, call me before you tweet, send me your tweets, we will discuss it, do not post it. Then he also talked about the articles that I was doing, the investigations I was doing. So, I mean, that that was General Asim Bajwa before, and then after that, that was General Asim Ghafoor, uh, who was the ISPR chief also. So both of them uh, would repeatedly uh, call, uh, you know, invite me to their office uh, or make their minions from the ISPR call, or at the same time, I mean, you know, on social media, they have these troll armies that would attack me, that would threaten me. Uh, so, so yeah, it was it was several times that I had to face that. You know, it's always it's always um, it's always strange to notice that such a big army with such officers like generals and everything that they are so you know intimidated and so afraid of people writing on Twitter. Where does this come from? Well, I think, I mean, uh, basically, uh, Pakistan is a very uh, insecure country because of its, you know, uh, its uh, kind of uh, accidental birth. You know, it, uh, the, the British were leaving in a hurry, so they gave Pakistan uh, to these opportunist politicians. Uh, and then the military became uh, a big dominant force very early on, which was the British military, actually. And uh, since the creation of Pakistan or the partition of India, uh, we've seen that the Pakistan military uh, has had this, you know, dominance and insecurity because the the borders that Pakistan has, they're disputed borders, you know, uh, from the Afghanistan side, from the Indian side, uh, all of these, uh, these, these lead to the Pakistan military being very insecure. And when you're insecure, you do not want any kind of criticism because you think that any kind of criticism can lead to, uh, you know, uh, further sort of uh, disruption in the system in the, in the way Pakistan uh, controls itself, uh, controls the people. Uh, <clears throat> I think, I mean, voices like mine uh, who speak uh, about things without any kind of censorship, I speak freely on Twitter. I, I write freely for, for international papers. I speak freely on television. Uh, they do not want that. In Pakistan, most of the people self-censor. They would say something else to you privately, but they will say something completely different publicly. And that's the atmosphere that the military has created through its intimidation, through its, its you know, harassment of uh, free thinkers like us. And they do not want that because, uh, you know, we are exposing them. And if we expose them, the Pakistan's population of 220 million people who are controlled by these, uh, you know, the, the, this, this occupying force, this oppressive force, uh, we, they will all start questioning it. And there will be a problem uh, because, uh, of course, they are wrong. Of course, they know that they are doing wrong. Uh, and uh, so they want to hide 
and they do not want anyone. So I, I actually, I mean, you know, if your question is interesting because I told the same thing exactly to the general once I met him. I said, General, uh, you know, the ISPR account that you have has millions of followers. I have thousands of followers. So you can just say whatever you want and I can say whatever I want. But he said, no, we should have the unity of message, which was basically uh, him telling me that I should do propaganda for him. Uh, but, you know, that's the idea that they want anyone with a credible voice, anyone with a genuine voice to work for the military to to continue their propaganda so that they can control the country for their own objectives and what are their objectives their objectives are to have uh, you know unlimited resources that they they basically you know have in the form of the businesses they have the plots that they have the factories that they have then you know the rich lavish lifestyle of the military pakistan military that's what they want to go, uh, uh, that's what they want to protect and that can be protected only by silencing voices like mine. And, you know, before we come to, to, to your life now in, in, in France, um, how you, you probably still have family. <coughs> um, so how is your, how is your family doing? Uh, are they, are they also intimidated? Are they also threatened? H how do they live? Uh, I mean, my, my parents uh, continue to live in Karachi and, uh, uh, I've reported this already and I've talked about it, that they have received uh, several visits since I've left five years ago uh, from the Pakistan uh, intelligence agencies, people who identify themselves to, to be from the ISI, visiting my parents' uh, house. Uh, my father was also uh, called into a safe house uh, of a Pakistani military brigadier um, who also identified himself from the ISI. Uh, and all of these several visits have ha had one thing in common, tell Taha to stop uh, speaking up, tell Taha to stop writing, tell Taha to stop tweeting. Uh, and then they have now recently expanded this intimidation and harassment uh, to not just my parents, but my, my partners, my wife's uh, family. Uh, who live in, in uh, the north of the country. Uh, then they even recently went to my sister's husband, who's my, so my sister's marriage. She lives in Karachi also. So they went to their the husband of my sister's uh, house uh, and uh, also again intimidated them. So <clears throat> I've had several sort of these uh, messages from Pakistan from my family. And my family has repeatedly told them that, uh, you know, I am not very much in touch with my family. I do not think like my family. I'm very much uh, distanced from my family. Um, and my family has repeatedly told them that, that Taha doesn't listen to us. He has nothing to do with us. But they continue to harass even once they told them that uh, directly, very directly told them that if something happens to you, Will Taha not care even if he doesn't agree with you? Will he not care if something happens to you? Uh, then they told my 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 brother-in-law that you know what what about your business? If something happens to your business, would Taha not care that his sister or his brother-in-law are in trouble? So they are using these intimidating tactics. Plus, uh, they've also said that you know Taha is in France, but uh, you know we can get anyone anywhere. I don't know if it's it's hyperbolic or if it's just uh, a verbal threat or if it, they can actually uh, carry it out. But as we've seen that, you know, there's the case of Akash Guraya, there's the case of Karima Baloj, Sajid Hussain, and the information that I've received about my name being on a kill list, that I think that they are being serious. So I do take some precautions. I do, uh, you know, I do, do take live, some, some do, kind do of you caution. Do you live in France or do you live under some protection? <clears throat> I know sensitive things, of course, but uh, can you live as a normal citizen of France, uh, in France? Or... No, I, 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 can, I can take a lot of precautions in the sense of where do I live, when I go home, when, when I come back, when I come to work. Of course, my bar is, 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 you know, the dissident club is a very visible place and everybody knows I'm there. And I've had uh, two, two cases of surveillance uh, from the Pakistan embassy, people who came that I've thought were suspicious and then, then I later investigated them and found out that they were working for the Pakistan embassy uh, and they they uh, confessed 
to a common journalist friend, Pakistani journalist friend, who showed me the recordings of them saying that, yes, they were sent by the Pakistan embassy to do to do spying on me. So I've had those problems in, in Paris also. But at the same time, the, the, uh, the Paris police is in touch with me. Uh, they are in constant, uh, you know, contact with me. And uh, I have repeatedly told them if I've had some problems. And they repeatedly advise me on how to uh, manage my life. Uh, so <clears throat> I am I am still like one of, I mean, it's, it's considered to be I'm a high profile uh, political uh, dissident in the country, in France. So I do have uh, some kind of protection. Of course, I don't have police protection 24 hours, but I do have contacts with the police uh, to ensure my safety. And um, the, one um, question now, now coming to, your, to, to France, I know that in Pakistan and even in our region of South Asia, uh, or even among, among intelligence agencies, th there is this notion that the inter-service intelligence, the ISI, is a state within a state. Some people say state above the state. Um, and that that might be true for Pakistan, of course. Uh, you, you sketch the history of the Pakistani army. Now, when coming to Europe, these are quite you know established democracies, almost okay. welfare states. Uh, and you mentioned Sajid Hussain in, in Sweden. You also mentioned Karima Baloch in Canada. Um, yeah, well, there is a stench uh, regarding the death of both these journalists from Balochistan that in some way the Pakistani state was involved. Do you believe that? I definitely think so. The The way Sajid Hussain disappeared uh, in March 2020 and then his body was found two months later. He was missing for two months. We do not know what was happening for those two months. Uh, the, the the Swedish police uh, did not investigate it thoroughly. Um, I think it it was to do with the fact that because Sajid was a political refugee from Balochistan, he did not have any political capital. So when you don't have any political capital, the police here doesn't uh, you know look into your cases. And that's why I think one of the reasons is why I've made myself very visible. I have a project running in Paris. Uh, I am very much involved in the Parisian society uh, to to because it helps uh, get me some protection and some some recognition in France, uh, and that helps me get uh, you know uh, protection from the police. Similarly, in the case of uh, Karima Baloch, uh, she went for a walk and then disappeared, and then you know her body was found next day in a lake. Uh, Sajid Hussain's body was found in a river. Uh, Karima Baluch's body was found in a lake. Uh, both of them did not leave any kind of notes behind that they were committing any kind of suicide. Uh, they were, they were, they had their lives. They had done all the struggle to get out of the country, uh, to continue talking about Pakistan, and then suddenly they they show up dead. So I think there is uh, all the fingers are pointing towards uh, the hands of uh, you know the 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 involvement of. Pakistani military. And we're seeing that, you know, uh, this phenomena is called transnational repression. And transnational repression is repression beyond the borders of a country that we're seeing is increasing in the Western countries. Uh, you know, the countries that host us, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, you know, with the case of Akaz Guraya, we've seen the assassin caught. We've seen other not just Pakistan, but other countries also for doing this. And I think Pakistan is following uh, those countries' playbook. You know, we've seen the very famous case of Jamal Khashoggi in 2018 in Istanbul. We've seen the case of uh, several Chinese dissidents uh, being, uh, you know, targeted in Europe, in France. Uh, we've seen uh, cases from Azerbaijan, from uh, ex other Soviet uh, states, from Russia, Iran. Uh, Turkey, Kurdish uh, people in Europe in exile, being attacked, being targeted. Uh, so transnational repression is a reality and we're seeing more and more of it. And Europe uh, and the Western world, which was con considered safe for people like us, are becoming increasingly unsafe uh, because these countries are carrying out these hostile activities, uh, including Pakistan. And, and you mentioned Khashoggi. Khashoggi was, of course, called into the embassy. We have seen Russian cases where very 
you know, um, very uh, technologically very advanced technology was used in the form of a umbrella with 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 some kind of poison in it. How you know you have been you have been receiving these threats for a long time. You mentioned Mr. Goraya in the Netherlands, <clears throat> whose whose would be assassin was caught and has been given a life imprisonment. How how do they do this? How, how does because the Pakistani ISI is of course you know, not the intelligence agency in the Netherlands or in France. So how do they go about it? Do they recruit uh, the diaspora? Do they actually get real assassins? How does it work? I mean, in the case of Akash Gray, we know that there was a British Pakistani involved who was being handled by someone through WhatsApp. The messages of WhatsApp that we have seen in the court uh, show that he was being handled by someone called, uh, I don't remember the name, but someone from Pakistan who was Mansoor or something like that. Uh, he was being handled by someone and this British Pakistani had a debt and they said that he will they will clear his debt, they will pay him because he was under debt like for 70, 80,000 euro uh, pounds. Mm -hmm. And they said that they will clear his debt and they told him that he has other targets in France. Also, the conversations revealed that there was a target that they were going to give him in France, which many people believe was me. Uh, so uh, I think they they hire local diaspora people who are in need of money. For example, uh, we've seen that in Pakistan. Um, you know, in 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 the past, General Musharraf, uh, who was the dictator of the country and is dead now, uh, he gave an interview to a Pakistani journalist in which he talked about killing people in exile <clears throat> very openly and saying that all the other countries do it, so why should we not do it? I mean, he was indicating that the the you know as as the former president and dictator of the country, he was saying that this is okay to do. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the other thing that with Sajid Hussain's case, according to our own investigation. Uh, that I've done personally and talked to people there and, and, and spoken to local media. <clears throat> the the place where Sweden, where he, he went missing from, has a very strong uh, local Pakistani drug mafia. So uh, there are suspicions that maybe the local drug mafia was used. Uh, in the case of Akaz Guraya, also the person who was the assassin, he was caught because of his linkages to the drug mafia. We know that Pakistan, uh, Pakistani state, uh, you know, Karachi is the biggest port in the world for heroin smuggling outside to the whole world, which comes through Afghanistan and then goes from Malochistan to Karachi and get out of the world. And this drug mafia and these drug kingpins are very working very closely to the Pakistani state. Without the Pakistani state support, they cannot operate. Uh, and in case of Sajid Hussain, he had investigated those drug mafias. Uh, he had he had investigated the you know the 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 drug lords of Baluchistan, uh, and it is possible that those might have, those contacts might have been used to silence him. Uh, similarly, in the case of Karima Baloch, I think, uh, you know, Canada has a very large, Toronto has a very large diaspora community of Pakistanis. Um, there are even uh, ex-Pakistani military uh, people that Karima Baloch actually spoke about in one of her, you know, speeches. If you look it up, you can find it that she talked about Pakistani mil ex-military officials harassing her. Uh, even in Canada and even like, you know, uh, bothering her there. So definitely, I mean, there are a number of different ways that they can use, uh, you know, Pakistan uh, military operates as a criminal in the country. So why will they not use criminals outside the country to carry out their own activities? And and do you think that, you know, because Pakistan also has to live in this world and, you know, they, they have been facing... <coughs> last so many years they've, they've been facing an economic crisis they've been called the epicenter of terrorism by many countries in the in the west um what do you think the the western countries where these dissidents are living and where they have been you know attacked or attempted to attack what do you think their course of action should be towards their pakistani interlocutors to towards the state of pakistan I, th I think that, you know, for example, in France, uh, I, will, I can talk about France firstly, but in France, for example, the people who have done surveillance on me, uh, the Pakistan embassy who uh, carries out these hostile activities, they should be given a strong message that you are embassies, you're diplomats, you're not here to do hostile activity. And if you do that, you will be expelled. 
uh, I think that's one of the first messages that uh, that you know these countries need to send uh, to Pakistan. Uh, did they secondly, do that in your uh, case? sorry, did they do that in your case? No, I have. I don't think they have done that, and I think that's what I've been urging the French authorities to do that. Similarly, in the UK, for example, you know the case of uh, the Pakistani British man arrested. There is a case there. He had contacts with people in Pakistan. But the British police or the British state has not demanded Pakistan to hand over that person or to investigate that person. That's a big, big uh, issue that why is the British state, why is the British, uh, you know, authorities, why are they not uh, questioning the person who was in Pakistan and they have evidence of it. Uh, similarly, you know, I think another thing that that Pakistani, that, that foreign countries should do is that Pakistan is heavily dependent on foreign aid, on getting, you know, bailouts from the IMF, getting, you know, uh, debts, repayments restructured from different countries in the West. And I think these Western countries should put their human rights values first. They should say to Pakistan that before we uh, give you any kind of aid, we can give you any kind of help, you need to fulfill the international human rights uh, values that, uh, you know, we all subscribe to. Uh, if we do not, but we don't see that happening. And that's probably because, you know, Pakistan plays its geostrategic position really well. You know, it's next to Iran. So it plays that. It's next to Afghanistan. It's next to China, next to India. And it has a geostrategic and geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, important uh, position in South Asia. And because of that, it blackmails, you know, America against China, China against America, uh, the UK, for example, I've been told that because of the large uh, diaspora community in the UK, uh, you know, the Pakistani government has repeatedly said that, oh, you know, uh, we have a big community here. So, you know, work with us rather than against us. So they blackmail. I've heard this from, you know, uh, from some diplomats, you know, internal conversations between Pakistan and the British uh, authorities saying that the British authorities are scared of the Pakistani diaspora. So they, they do not go all out against them. Uh, we've seen, you know, there's another example of this case of Asia Bibi. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, you know, not related, but related in some ways. When Asia Bibi, who was a, a Christian Pakistani woman on death row, was, uh, you know, convicted for death sentence for blasphemy, and then later on her conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court. And when she had to leave the country, England refused to, to host her, saying that we do not want any uh, local trouble. I mean, England is supposed to be the country where, you know, bills of rights and all these human rights values have come from. And they are refusing to host a Christian woman who has been persecuted for over 10 years for false blasphemy charges. So this is the kind of like, uh, you know, uh, way they operate with very sort of limited, uh, you know, <clears throat> reaction to Pakistan. I think it's about time that Western states should wake up and should realize that Pakistan is abusing the friendship or the the, <clears throat> the friendly attitudes of these countries and make Pakistan, hold Pakistan accountable for all its activities. Because until that happens, nothing will change. Of course, we will continue to see that again and again. And Pakistan will become bolder as we are seeing that. We're seeing Pakistan is becoming bolder and bolder in its, uh, you know, in its uh, in its hostile activities. I mean, recently, for example, in London, I was shocked to see that people from the Khalistan movement, which is backed by the ISI, a well-known fact, everybody knows that ISI supports them uh, in Canada, in 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 the UK, and they attacked the Indian embassy. Uh, in 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 the UK, they were the Indian Indian embassy or the consulate was attacked. Uh, by Khalistani people, and and this is this is completely, you know, at the back of this is, is are the are the the Pakistani uh, intelligence agencies. But what happened? Nothing happened as of yet. And coming to you know this 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 issue, which is quite recent, you mentioned about the Khalistan. There is of course this thing going on. There's this revival of these Khalistani activities also within India. Um, and this happened recently in the UK, and you see a lot of voices coming out from Canada as well. Um, it, it, as you said, it's well known that the Pakistanis have supported 
the Khalistan movement in the 90s uh, much more. Uh, this was part of the K2 uh, strategy, which was Kashmir and Khalistan. Um, why do you think it has been revived now again? Well, I think, I mean, it, it never went, uh, you know, it, it was not like left alone. I think <clears throat> in the 90s, it was more prominently, we were seeing that. And in the 2000s, it went a little bit low profile and low key because Pakistan had, you know, General Musharraf and there was the military. And so the military could not be, uh, could not afford to do these kind of activities because they were trying to show the, to the West that they're trying to change so that they could get money from the West. Uh, as soon as the military dictatorship ended in 2008, uh, we were seeing that Pakistan has gone back to the military, has gone back to its old activities where it's, uh, you know, sponsoring jihadis in Kashmir. Uh, we saw in Afghanistan, the Kashmir, you know, the Afghan jihadis or the Afghan Taliban were sponsored. And, and eventually we now see the Afghan Taliban government or an occupation of the Afghan Taliban in Afghanistan. I think um, Pakistan wants to, you know, there's been there have been statements about, you know, uh, bleeding India with a thousand cuts, you know, like slowly bleeding India. And I think, <clears throat> <coughs> sorry, I think uh, Pakistan uh, uh, understands that, you know, uh, they, these are uh, weak or fault lines in, in India, which they can exploit uh, because <clears throat> India has an international stage. India, India has a much more, you know, international credibility and they want to counter that. So they counter that by sponsoring and, and supporting these kind of movements. I mean, you know, the one of the, the, the biggest sort of uh, telling, you know, of the Khalistan movement is that the Khalistani movement are, are by the Sikh people. And the Sikh people, their headquarters is actually in Pakistan, but they never demand anything about independence of Pakistan, uh, you know, the area of Pakistan being in, made independent. So uh, they're basically, even in their own uh, struggle for independence of Khalistan, they're not very sincere and they're not very true because they're asking half, half of the Khalistan and not the full Khalistan, which shows that they have some connections with Pakistan and they do not want to disturb those connections. So they do not ask for independence from the Pakistan side, even though for the Sikh people, the Pakistani side is more important than the Indian side. Yeah, it's like, you know, to call it the, the Mecca of the Sikh people lies in Pakistan. Um, so, you know, you talked about this military dictatorship, which ended in 2008. And now we are in 2023. Some chief of army staffs came and they, they they went away. Now we have a new chief of army staff. There is, of course, there has been for a long time some, some, some pronounced pressure on Pakistan from the IMF, from the FATF. Um, although, you know, in the UN, they have always been backed by, uh, by China uh, in the UN Security Council. But the IMF and the FATF have put some pressure on them. Um, to change or mend their ways in, in, in when it comes to supporting uh, and exporting terrorism. Um, do you think that has happened? Do you think it will happen? Uh, or do you think this is just, you know, lying low and at some point of time they will go back to, to what they were do, doing? No, I think they're not even lying low. I think the, the thing is that Pakistan is very create has become much more creative at hiding its uh, its uh, you know terror assets, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's become much more you know they 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 realize that the world needs some action, so they do some cosmetic actions. Uh, you know they will put uh, half a side into a house jail, but half a side is living a normal life in that house jail that he is in. He's convicted for some unknown crimes, not for Mumbai attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, other. People from like <clears throat> Jesh -e Mohammed, for example, continue to operate, but under new names. Uh, you know, they said about Ma Maulana Masood Azhar. Uh, recently, Pakistan foreign minister, the ex foreign minister now, uh, said on TV that uh, we don't know where he is. Everybody knows where he is. So you know, this this sort of like duplicity. They continue to do that, uh, but they have become much more creative and much more, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated at hiding their tracks uh, because of course you know when you do this for such a long time uh, you improve and when you have demands from imf 
from FATF, from other American counterparts or, or British counterparts or Western counterparts to do something about terror, then you say, okay, we have, Pakistan has uh, terrorism as a state policy to support terrorism as a state policy. So if it has that state policy, it's not going to change its state policy overnight just because someone tells them to do that. They will make sure that that state policy becomes much more hidden from the world. And I think that's what Pakistan is doing right now. Uh, they hide it much better. Uh, we know that still, you know, Pakistan has, I mean, for example, right now in Europe, I, I found out about it recently that from Europe, uh, you can still do hundi or hawala to Pakistan, uh, which means Pakistan is still using uh, illegal channeling of funds. So if they are using these illegal channeling of funds, uh, you know, we've seen cases in, in Italy uh, where Pakistanis were involved in, you know, uh, cases of, uh, you know, criminal activity, of, uh, of uh, money laundering activity. In Paris also, there were some people caught for money laundering from Pakistan to France, uh, France to Pakistan. Uh, we've seen in uh, recently in Greece, there was a case of uh, some people who were trying to blow up a Jewish restaurant, which had Pakistani connections. So, I mean, you know, every now and then, but of course, on both sides, you know, the, the, the Western states have become much more uh, aware of what is going on. So they get, they, they are, they use preventive measures. They catch them before anything happens. And Pakistan has become much more creative at hiding its tracks. Mm -hmm. So, do uh, one question in between b b before I go on to this. Uh, the in Pakistan, you know, big wigs of Pakistan politics and army have been called traitors, um, have been called Indian agents or Jewish agents or anti Islam. I, you know, former prime ministers, presidents, army generals, even Nobel uh, Prize winners. You uh, in that you know in that list, you are a common Pakistani a journalist. Do you also deal with such you know apart from attempted attacks on your life, but do you also deal with such epithets and such uh, you know name calling or such pressure? Of course, I mean you know uh, the criticism in Pakistan is that. If, if you are criticizing Pakistan, then you must be a foreign agent. But uh, this is this is uh, xenophobia, and this is basically uh, a, a strategy to discredit you uh, and say that you know you are working with, uh, with 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 foreign enemies, and that's why you want to destabilize the country. Uh, but for us, we are not trying to destabilize the country. I mean, in my opinion, I was trying to improve Pakistan. I was trying to make the country better, uh, you know, have better human rights values, better uh, values for, for, for the, the common people of Pakistan, for, for protecting their rights, etc. cetera. But uh, the Pakistani state, which does this, runs this propaganda campaigns against, you know, several uh, prominent people uh, and, and calls them foreign agents, uh, they do that because they have no other, you know, proof or evidence. So it's easier way to say it that they're being operated by foreign agents and foreign foreign uh, countries and foreign, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, and and distract uh, people from, you know, their and and because Pakistan, the population in Pakistan has been, you know, uh, brainwashed, controlled for so many years through a very narrow uh, understanding of what Pakistan means, through a very narrow uh, understanding of the Pakistani curriculum, the studies, you know, Pakistan studies, it's full of propaganda against the West. It's full of propaganda against minority religions, like, uh, you know, in Pakistan, like Christianity or Hinduism. It, it, it actually paints Hindu people or Christian people as a problem. So there's this, you know, this, uh, you know, um, a whole, Pakistan project is about creating this narrow self-identity and that narrow self-identity as soon as you step out of it you're considered a foreign agent so that's that's a very uh, I, I think that's a, it's a that's a strategy that the Pakistani state has been playing for a very long time okay and when we when we come to today you of course Pakistan has been you know this this terrorism has been a state tool currently you see that in Afghanistan, the Taliban is in power, which, you know, maybe relations now between the Pakistani 
army and Taliban are not that great, but they are they are they are actually you know they they have been invented. The Taliban is a is a, is a, is a, is an invention of the Pakistani army. Uh, Pakistan is dealing with internal um, call it insurgencies uh, with with the TDP with uh, Baloch uh, the Pashtun is is much more of a social non-violent movement um and you know many analysts in the west have been for a long long time saying that it is just about to fall or just about to fail when things were looking much better than they do now um now with all these internal disturbances and with afghanistan on its uh, on its border with the taliban there what do you think will happen? How what, how do you see Pakistan in the coming five to ten years? I think, I mean, you know, uh, firstly, with the Afghan Taliban, we've been saying that, you know, do not trust uh, militants or terrorists ever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mercenaries like that are not to be trusted, but Pakistan military did not listen to any of us. Uh, you know, it, it thought that it had a very strategic relationship with the Pak Afghan Taliban. But now what are the Afghan Taliban doing? They're hosting the Pakistani Taliban and you, Pakistan, Afghanistan is being used uh, to, you know, protect the Pakistani Taliban who are carrying out attacks against Pakistan. Uh, so, you know, the Afghan Taliban, but still I think Pakistan has a lot of leverage that it does not use because most of these Afghan Taliban have still families in Pakistan, they have business concerns in Pakistan, uh, they have presence in Pakistan, so Pakistan can do much more uh, to uh, pressure Afghan uh, Taliban uh, to, to do something against the Pakistan Taliban. But the thing is, with you know, I've, I've, I've seen this happening in, in Pakistan also, the, the attitude towards Pakistan and Taliban is not to eliminate them or not to eradicate them, but the attitude is to convert them to work for Pakistan. So Pakistan, you know, the Pakistani state, the military, and I've, I've had like personal interactions with military uh, officials who, who would tell me that, yeah, uh, our purpose is, you know, why bring the terrorists into the judicial process, etc., when we can use them for our own means. So their their thing is that if someone is so ideologically motivated to go and do terrorism in the name of Islam, he should be treated as an asset uh, for Pakistan rather than as an as a as a problem for Pakistan. Uh, even though if he's a problem today, tomorrow he could be an asset. So this is the mentality that Pakistan has, and it continues to pay the price for it, but does not learn from it. Uh, actually, you know, uh, if you remember with the uh, former ISI chief, he gave an interview to Al Jazeera where he said when the 140 children were killed in the Peshawar school attack, he said that was collateral damage in the strategies that we have. So this is the this is the attitude that they have that people of Pakistan are dying and they're calling them collateral damage. As far as your other question is concerned about what is going to happen with Pakistan, I think Pakistan is... Uh, or, is and has been on the verge of uh, internal implosion. Um, you know, we've seen that happening in 1971 with Bangladesh once. Uh, we might see that happening with the Pashtuns. Uh, the Baloch have been fighting for a very long time. Uh, there are, uh, you know, people unhappy in, in, in Sindh, in, in the Sindh province. Punjab is the only place where there is some kind of you know, uh, still some kind of unity, but even that has been disrupted now with Imran Khan's ouster and Imran Khan having a big following in Punjab uh, and people have come out against the military in Punjab. Uh, you know, every day we see trends against the military on social media. We see uh, big names, big politicians, including Imran Khan, naming the army chief, uh, saying that he's involved, he's, you know, he's involved in politics, etc. And so we're seeing that Pakistan is, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a disaster happening in slow motion. Mm -hmm. uh, the speed of this uh, slow motion is adjusted. Sometimes it goes a little faster, sometimes it goes a little slower, but nevertheless, it's a disaster. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to end well. Uh, the country, if it continues the way it continues, uh, and does not change its ways, does not change its, its 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 way of governance, its way of you know of uh, of interact of social contract with people. Uh, the country is going to implode, uh, and we've already seen that once. Uh, so it, it's it's it, it, it's very likely that it might happen again uh, if Pakistan doesn't change or the Pakistani policymakers do not change their policy. And to to slow that disaster from happening. Uh, do you see a return? You just said they are, they have become smarter to 
pursue state uh, policy and, and thereby terrorism as a means, do you see a return to much more overt um, use of terrorism in places like, indeed, you men mentioned India uh, with the Khalistanis or also Kashmir? I mean, I think uh, the thing is with, with Pakistan, uh, they have been managed to sort of, you know, with the use of internet, with the use of technology, they've been managed to uh, rile up local indigenous populations now. We're seeing that in Kashmir, the Islamization process that ha started with, you know, Jaish Muhammad or Lashkar Taiba, uh, going into Kashmir and, 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 and inside Kashmir, you know, uh, crossing the border, uh, that has become less and less, but through social media, through these, you know, uh, social media networks, uh, secret, uh, you know, on Telegram uh, or, or YouTube, they are Islamizing the population. And then they are also using funds uh, that are being sent to these places and, and helping them with monetary and, uh, you know, uh, psychological or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, Islamization uh, aspect of it. Like, you know, it's training on, on a on a literature level, uh, same with Khalistan movement, etc. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, right now, Pakistan is faced with a lot of internal problems. Uh, so it, externally, it, it will be hard for them to do this. But uh, we've seen that it could be a distraction tactic. Also, uh, it could be a tactic to jeopardize democracy in the country. We've seen that, you know, when the Mumbai attacks happened, uh, they happened in 2008, right after this whole sort of you know, a movement from Pakistan saying that we want to befriend India, we want to beef, uh, and Musharraf saying that, you know, the six point uh, agenda that he had with, with the Indian government and he was like about to sign it, etc. I actually met Musharraf uh, back in 2016, I think, and I asked him about it and he said, yeah, we were about to sign it. Uh, and then, you know, the Pakistani government came and it didn't, and he forgot about the fact that the Mumbai attacks happened. He forgot about the fact that, you know, uh, the, the, this was done to sabotage uh, relationships between other countries. So I think even at the same time when Pakistani democracy gets stronger or in any way becomes uh, better, you know, or improves, uh, the Pakistan military sabotages it by doing these international acts uh, through their proxy uh, militants. So I think I'm, I'm, I am afraid that if Pakistani democracy, because Pakistan military is facing so much trouble at home, uh, uh, from, uh, you know, Democrats, from the civilian side, that it might create these distractions internationally uh, to have some legitimacy at home. While there is also talk about the army, or the best way out of this is the army, uh, you know, formally taking over, uh, which is, of course, a possibility. Yeah. It is a possibility. They might create a situation where they might say that this is, this is the best way to go forward. I mean, you know, like they did in 99, or they've done several times. Pakistan is not a stranger to military coups. Uh, so we might see it again. And, and this time around, we have like a military chief who is uh, a half is a Quran. So, you know, I don't know how radicalized he is. Uh, but uh, I mean, you know, there is a lot of lot of pressure on the military to, to do something. And when there's this kind of pressure, they react very brutally. Hmm. Uh, Taha, as you as you said in the beginning, we had almost an, uh, an hour. I think we we're just crossing that. While this conversation can of course go on for another hour because it's so interesting. But coming to the end of the of the interview, uh, a few questions: Are you do you want at some point of time? Do you want to go back? I I think I mean visiting Pakistan uh, should be an option that should be available to any Pakistani. Uh, living anywhere in the world. So I have the right to go back to the country that I am uh, a citizen or uh, I am I identify myself as a Pakistani first, uh, then a citizen of France later, perhaps. Uh, so I should have the right to go back. Uh, the, the fact that my name is on a kill list deters me from going back. Um, so that's one, one factor why I would not go back. Uh, as far as going back and living in Pakistan as I used to live, I, I I continue to now say this that you know Pakistan is a very dysfunctional country. I'm a I'm a big free thinker. Um, I do I criticize religion. I do not 
uh, uh, you know, practice Islam anymore. Um, I I have a very sort of open lifestyle, progressive lifestyle. Uh, so Pakistan is not a very friendly country for people like me to live in. So I do not think I can go back and live there uh, if the circumstances are the way they are. Uh, but of course, it's uh, it's my home country. It's where I grew up. So I would like to visit my some of my family is there, my friends are there, you know, my old uh, you know old networks are there. So you know, as a human being, uh, those things are you know they make you nostalgic. You want to go back and visit them sometimes, and I'm denied that right. So I think I should be given that right. And and while living in France, you will, of course, continue trying to improve the situation of Pakistani origin people in Europe, but also of Pakistanis back home? I mean, that's my idea. I think my idea is, uh, I mean, not to improve, but uh, rather raise awareness about what's going on in Pakistan. I want to sort of, you know, uh, shed light on Pakistan, uh, 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 you know, the Pakistan military's atrocities, especially because I think the Pakistani people are the first victims of the Pakistani military. Uh, after that are the other victims, you know, in, in neighboring countries uh, or internationally. But I really want to focus on talking about the Pakistan military. So the purpose of the dissident club as the bar, the purpose of my book as my autobiography, all of that focuses on how it is to grow up in this country where there's so many controls of the society, uh, so, so much of, you know, uh, conditioning, so much of limitations, and uh, how a person like me was fighting all of that. Uh, so my, my, my purpose is to continue to speak up and raise awareness uh, so that one day uh, the Pakistan military would be held accountable for all its crimes against humanity. No, it's a very pertinent point you made. And and that is actually the you know, it's it's a sad reality is that essentially it's the Pakistani people, uh, the country of Pakistan, who is the who are the biggest victims or sufferers of this policy of their own military. Uh, let alone you know the neighboring countries or even in the West, it's first uh, their own country and their own citizens which uh, which are denied their basic human rights. It's. It's, it's elite capture, you know, it's uh, 5% or 4-5% or of Pakistani elites which have the military on the top and then there's the political class, then the bureaucracy, the judiciary uh, and the clerics, uh, the clergy, the Islamic, uh, you know, uh, groups. Uh, so it's the military with along with the, the collaboration of these elites, which is 4 to 5% of the population or even less, which is dominating and and victimizing the rest of the ninety five percent of the country. Uh, Dahab, uh, thank you very much for this for this very very interesting interview. Um, uh, as I said, you know we could go on for for another few hours, but maybe we can do uh, you know um, a second part some some sometime. Uh, I again congratulations on the on the publication of your book i hope many people uh, read it or actually you know it's it's in a comic book format so read it and see it um and yeah the only thing i can say to you is please stay safe we need more people like you thank you so much thank you for having me Jeanette, and uh, we keep in touch for sure thank you thank you sir.